Let's conclude our series on the Noahide laws. So in part one, we looked at the early sources, we looked at the Chumash, we looked at the Gemara in Sanhedrin, in Cholin, and we saw how, where the Noahide laws come from. Traditionally, it was understood that there were seven, but then in the same pages of the Gemara that say seven, if you actually add up what else it says, it's actually 30. So we have seven laws, we have 30 laws. And then in part two, we basically reconciled that, why was it seven before and 30 now? And we made the case that in the Messianic age, the seven laws expand to 30 laws based on various prophecies in Zechariah, in Ishayahu. And specifically, we looked at learning Torah and keeping Shabbat, which until recently has been understood as Noahides should not learn Torah except what is specifically relevant to them. And many have called for that to, to change, that there should be a revolution in, in Torah learning, that we should open up all aspects of Torah learning for everyone, and Noahides and all Gentiles, and whatever, that everybody should learn Torah and benefit from Torah. And then I took it one step further and said the same should be true for Shabbat, because Shabbat is such a powerful tool to make life better, especially in today's day and age. The world needs it more than ever that we really should bring Shabbat to the whole world, and that could bring Geula. And that's, I didn't make that up, that comes straight from Ishayahu, because Ishayahu and Avi says, Isaiah chapter 56, which we went into in depth, it says that in the, in the end of days, all peoples should keep Shabbat. Every ben nechar, every foreigner, every saris, every eunuch, everybody should keep Shabbat. And then that will bring, when that happens, that will bring the third temple, which will be a Beit Tefillah Lechol Ha'amim. It'll be an international house of prayer. So the message in Isaiah is clear that Shabbat at the end of days should become for everybody. And that's what's going to actually bring about the final redemption. And the order there is actually pretty clear. Some people were commenting like, well, we're not in the end of days yet. How do you know that we're in the end of days? But the, the sequence of events over there is clear that we have to do, keep, bring Shabbat and Torah to the nations first. Then there will be, God says, then I will bring the ingathering of the exiles after that. So the sequence is clear. We don't have to wait for Mashiach to come and the ingathering of the exiles and the third temple and only then open up Torah and Shabbat to the world. The sequence that Ishayahu presents is actually the other way. You start by teaching Torah, which makes more sense. First, you have to actually spread the Torah knowledge to the world first before you can do all these other, other things. And uh, for those who said, like, we, we don't know if the Noahide laws should expand from 7 to 30 in the Messianic age, but we're not in the Messianic age yet. We're not in the Acharit Ayamim. We're not in the end of days, some people said. But we've talked about this many times before. We already looked at all the prophecies, and all the prophecies have come true. It's pretty clear that we are in the end of days already. I mean, the fact that we have, for the first time in 2,000 years, more than 2,000 years, an independent, prosperous Jewish state in the Holy Land. That's already an incredible prophecy, many prophecies that have come true, right? which when has that happened? You know, for thousands of years, we've been waiting to return to Jerusalem. Today, we have that opportunity. Any, any one of us could be in Jerusalem by the end of the week. That's never you know, been possible in the last two millennia. So, of course, if you just open your eyes, it's clear that we're in the end of days. The prophets say God would bring us back to Israel, al kanfein the sharim on the wings of eagles, and that's quite literally what happened. Just metal eagles called airplanes, but people are literally flying back to Israel now. So we're, we're already in the midst of Geula. We don't have to go through all the signs again, but remember the, the number one greatest sign, the Gemara says. What's the greatest sign? that you know that you're in the end of days. How do you know that you're in Geula? What was the biggest sign, the Gemara says? En ketz There's no greater sign of Geula, of the redemption, than what it says in Yechezkel chapter 36, The land of Israel should blossom again and give forth fruits and uh, trees and fruits and so on for the Jewish people that are returning to the land, give fruits in abundance. And Israel today does produce a, an abundance of fruits, enough not just for itself, but to export. You can get Israeli fruit produce in Costco here, and in Dubai, and in Australia, and everywhere around the world. That's never happened in history, never. And so that in and of itself, the Gemara says that's the greatest sign that you know you're in the days of redemption. If 
the produce of Israel, the fruits of Israel, the trees of Israel are giving fruit to the world. When has that ever happened in history? Never. We say every, every time you go to a wedding, you, we quote from Yirmiyahu, that's a prophecy in chapter 33. Yirmiyahu says, Once more will be heard in this place, this place that has been destroyed and barren for so long. And God promises and says that a day will come when you'll hear again, kol sason ve kol simcha, right? Kol chatan ve kol kala. You'll hear the, so- the sound of happiness, of weddings, of the bride and groom. And today you go to Jerusalem pretty much every day. You see a wedding, right? A wedding procession. You've seen this? Chupas, you know, in Jerusalem, all over the place. How, that's, if any of you have participated in a wedding in Jerusalem or seen it, that's Jeremiah fulfilled, right? For 2,000 years, this didn't happen. And now again, you have weddings daily in Jerusalem. This is, again, prophecy come true. So, you, nope, you can't really say that we're not in the end of days. To say that we're not in a charita, I mean, to say that we're not in the times of Geula would be just ignoring all these clear, unambiguous prophecies in Tanakh. It's the issue of st- st- being stuck to a galut mindset. That's an issue that we have to deal with that we still haven't caught up. Not all aspects, not all parts of the Jewish world have caught up and realized that we're already in Geula. A lot of us are still in a Galut mindset. So it's really up to the individual. Are you still in the old mindset of exile and oppression, Galut, or are you already, oh look, are, you, are your eyes open to Geula? You know, they say the difference between Galut and Geula is just really one letter in the root letters, right? Galut is with a taf, and you get rid of the taf, and you put an aleph, and you get geula. Right. So what's the difference between a taf and an aleph? Otherwise, it's the same root letters. So the t- one is at the beginning, and one is at the end. Right. Taf is the last letter of the alphabet. Aleph is the first letter of the alphabet. Taf is, represents, actually, mavet. It's called the seal of death. It represents death, taf. It's the last letter of the alphabet. The Gemara says that when a person, when God sends destruction to the world, that he marks those who are destined to die with a tuff on their forehead. Tzadikim are marked with a tuff made of, of, of ink to protect them. And the wicked are marked with a tuff of blood that marks them for destruction. And you know, if you know ancient Israelite script, this is a kind of a segue to our next series on the secrets of the Hebrew alphabet. Uh, if you've ever seen ancient Israelite script, it's, what does a tuff look like? Anybody know? It's actually a little X. The way they used to draw a tuff was an X. So you were marked with an X you know, in ancient times. So we'll have to talk about that. The, the tuff that we have today versus the tuff in ancient Israelite script. You know, we have the Torah tuff and the, the common Israelite script, the vernacular tuff, did not look the same. But tuff is associated with death. And Aleph is the exact opposite. Aleph is light. Aleph is God, right? Aleph is one. It's oneness, oneness, um, unity, oneness, godliness. Remember, Aleph is made up of a Vav and a Yud and a Yud. It's made up of Vav, Yud, Yud is 26. It's Hashem. It's Yud, He, Vav, He. So you have, you replace the Galut, you take the tough out, that mindset of death and oppression, and you replace it with an Aleph, with God, with life, with light. That's Geula. So it's really up to us which mindset we want to have. There are those who want to stick with the Galut mindset and pretend like we're still, you know, wherever in Eastern Europe. And others have already moved on and said, look, we, we have Israel, we have Jerusalem. We have an abundance of Torah. Everybody in their pocket is carrying with them all the thousands of Torah texts, all these Torah apps, and there's so much Torah learning. Never in history have there been so many synagogues and yeshivas and the communi- Jewish communities and like... It's incredible, right? We, we have to realize that, and we should never forget that we are already in Geula. We're just missing a few of the final puzzle pieces. All the prophecies have already come true, except for a couple, maybe. So we're almost there. So, therefore, if we really want Geula, if we're serious about Geula, then we also have to be serious about the Noahide laws, and it's inevitable that they have to expand from 7 to 30. That's been prophesied, that's clear, that's in the Gemara. That's in Shmuel Gaon, as we saw, the Ramamifano. They all gave us lists of 30. So it's time for a transition. We're in that time period. So we have those three lists, and we have our final task, which is to put them together, because they weren't exactly the same. The 30 that we derived from the Gemara, 
from Sanhedrin and Chulin, and the 30 that Shmuel Gaon gave us, and the 30 that the Ramah Mifano gave us, they're not exactly the same. There's significant overlap, but they're not the same. So can we put them all together? Can we make sense of it? And we still have some other questions that we want to answer that we didn't get to last time. Last time we talked about Pesach, we talked about Sukkot, we talked about Mezuzah, but there are still others like Tefillin. I got a question this week. Can uh, Noah Hyde put on Tefillin? Prayers, praying for Masidur. Which prayers are allowed? Shema, Amida, which blessings can, can a Noah Hyde say any brachot? Right? What? So there's all, all these fascinating questions that we still have to explore. Honoring. Brit, yeah, honoring parents. Yeah. Meaning, are they obligated to? Should they? Are they obligated to? And should they even? Even if they're not obligated to? Would it be appropriate to? We're not policing anybody. There's this conspiracy theory which is so absurd. And I've gotten a bunch of comments from these anti-Semites. This is the conspiracy theory, if you haven't heard it yet. The conspiracy theory is that the Jews are plotting to put the Noahide laws, to impose the Noahide laws on the whole world and they will be punishable by death, and whoever doesn't follow the seven Noahide laws will be executed by the secret Jewish cabal, right? This is, the, this is the silly conspiracy theory, the nonsense that a lot of people out there believe. And they show pictures of the Lubavitchers with the president. Look, you see, the, they already got the President Reagan and Bo, George Bush, the senior, to sign it into law, and the Noahide laws are American laws. Really? Where? Where have you seen that? How are the Noahide laws the law of America? So there's a silly conspiracy out there that people think that the Noahide laws are somehow sinister, but it's, of course, the exact opposite. Uh, The Noahide laws are meant to make the world a better place. So we want to actually simplify them, make sense of them, uh, find, try to make a kind of definitive list of 30. So let's go through it. So the first, there's 10 that the three lists that we had, there's 10 that they for sure agree on, and there's no difference whether it's the Gemara, Shmuel Gaon, or uh, the Ramami Fano. What were those 10? Remember the set of 10? What was 10 there? The 10 under the category of, you know, of Avodah Zarah, of idolatry. And we said that there were 10 types of witchcraft, sorcery, idolatry. So those 10 are actually identical in all three lists. So that's good. We can get those out of the way. There's nothing to debate there. The first one is just any kind of idolatry, anything to do with worshiping idols, uh, the second one is Ma'avir Ba'esh, which is all kinds of things that used to be like child sacrificial rituals in the past. I think you can expand Ma'avir Ba'esh to anything, any kind of really child abuse would fit under this. You know, we still have, unfortunately, and sadly and tragically, so much of this tra- child trafficking happening in the world and all kinds of horrible things and harassment of children and all kinds. So... I would put all that under Ma'avir Ba'esh. Anything that's abusing children, every, all of that is prohibited. Anything Ma'avir Ba'esh, any kind of child sacrifice, which today can express itself in different uh, ways. So that's the second one. The third one was, was uh, Kosem, which is all kinds of magic, incantation, enchantments. And then the next one was Me'onen. Me'onen, remember, from the word ona, which means calculating certain times, saying that this time is auspicious, this time is not. This is a good time to do a particular surgery or invest in a business or whatever. This is not, this is not a good time. So anything that's based on superstition, that's being a me'onen, that's forbidden. Uh, the Talmud over there actually also gives another opinion that me'onen might also imply something of a sexual nature. So any kind of idolatry or witchcraft or sorcery involving some kind of sexual sin. Ein. But the pshat of it is, as Rabbi Akiva also says, and the Rambam says clearly, we, we went through that in part one, that a me'onen is somebody who is uh, almost like an astrologer or somebody who tells you certain times are fortunate or not, and you act on that, acting on those calculations. It's a lack of faith in God. If there's God, then why, why would it matter if it's Wednesday or Thursday or March or April or Av or Adar? It doesn't matter. God is infinite, eternal, unchanging. Ani Hashem lo shaniti, he says. So why would it matter what day of the year it is or what time of day it is? 
You have to have perfect faith in God. Like God told Abraham, Ein mazal Israel, forget the mazalot, forget the constellations, just have faith in God, everything will be fine. So that was number four. The fifth was Menachesh, which is to try to predict the future, divining the future through all kinds of uh, unkosher means. So trying to predict the future. Mechashef is just a general term for witchcraft and wizardry. Chover Chaver, which is mixing things together, maybe concocting all kinds of uh, witchcraft brews, and also incense. The Gemara says it's lighting incense to various idols and things like that. That might have actually applications in certain Eastern religions, you know, that lighting incense to the Buddha or whatever it is, that, that could be part of this too. Ketoret is also incense. It's all about who you're directing your incense to. So if you're directing your incense to God, then... That's fine. Yeah, you can, you can smell nice. That's not a problem. But if you're lighting incense, incense as an offering to some deity, that would be forbidden. Yeah, or if it has some idolatry, it's part of some idolatrous ritual, that would be yeah, inappropriate. Okay, so then of, which implies literally like a father or ancestor worship, which used to be common back then, or um, summoning ghosts, channeling ghosts, all of that kind of thing. That's of. Yidoni is similar. It's uh, trying to get information from the dead, channeling the dead. And Shoel Met is the last one, which is also, they're all, Ov Yedoni and Shoel Met are all in the same category of things that have to do with ghosts and dead spirits and necromancy and like going to cemeteries and doing rituals and stuff over there, like idolatrous rituals or superstitious things or trying to communicate with the dead. So those are the 10, the first 10. All three lists agree on those. Then you have Gilu Arayot, which is another major category of sexual sins, sexual immorality. And we saw how you can derive them all from one verse in Genesis that God told Adam, remember? So from that verse, you can derive all of these prohibitions. And they are adultery, they are incest, they are bestiality, they are sodomy. All are part of the category of Gilui Arayot. So one question you can ask here is why group them all into one? Why not separate these into separate mitzvahs? The other ones we grouped into ten, like the ten, the one of Odazara we split into ten. But this one we keep all together as one Gilui Arayot. Why not separate these? Anybody have an idea? So I think the reason is that there's only one here that's actually common. Like, no, nobody in their right mind generally does these other things. Like, bestiality is not something that the average person ever wants to do, or incest. Like, these things are naturally very disgusting, and I think nobody, no sane person has any desire for these things. That's why I don't think they're weighty enough to have their own category. I would put sodomy in there too, although people would challenge me on that one. But uh, I think also for any straight person, anyways, a straight man. Yeah, unfortunately. But I think for any straight man, all three of these things, whether it's incest, bestiality, or sodomy, they're probably all equally uh, gross and not tempting in any kind of way. So I think the only one here in Gilu Rayot that is actually somewhat common would be adultery. So I think it's really like adultery, and then the other things are just thrown in there because they are important, but they're just so extremely rare and unlikely that the average person would ever even be tempted to do these things. So that's why I kind of see it as just adultery and then these other sexual perversions. Okay, so that was Gilu uh, Arayot, and then you have a marriage Okay, which was also on the, based on Davak Be'ishto, that if you have adultery, then you have to have marriage. Like, they go together, right? If there's no marriage, then there's no adultery. There's no issue of adultery. So we saw how it's from Bereshit, because the Torah says Davak Be'ishto, a person should glue to his wife, that derives that every Adam and Eve, every human being, should have a mitzvah to get married. But marriage comes from God, right? Yeah. Meaning, the Torah says yeah. marriage, yeah. It's not a natural thing to get married. Biologically, marriage doesn't make sense. That's why today, in, a, in an increasingly atheistic world, marriage, marriage rates have been plummeting. 
less and less people are getting married. Because if you're not really religious in any way and you don't believe in God, then why get married? Really? Like, it doesn't really make sense. Why tie yourself to one person for the rest of your life? Biologically, we're mammals. And mammals don't have marriage. Birds, and nature. birds yes. But we're not birds, we're mammals. Yeah. Right? There are monogamous birds. But, but uh, right? yeah. Mammals tend to be either serial monogamists, meaning every year they have, they, every mating season they find a different mate. Could be the same one, but they, they look for a new mate every year. Or they are essentially polygamists, like a gorilla or a lion, where the, the alpha male has many females at the same time. So if we're mammals, then marriage is mamush, illogical, and it wouldn't fit our biology. So that's marriage. And then, remember in Chulin it said, Yes, there's marriage, but there's no same-sex marriage. So again, it's clearly implied that marriage is one of the Noahide laws, and that's why you also have adultery and no same-sex marriage. So the Gemara in Chulin says that the Noahide, that the Gentiles did keep, although in recent years that's changed, right? Today, same-sex marriage has become permitted in many Western countries. But, but today, today mm-hmm. promoted? And pr- not just permitted, but promoted Advertised, yeah. Why do you think the Yom Kippur meeting is all on the... Uh... That's a classic question. Why is the Yom Kippur Torah reading the, all about Gilu Arayot, Mincha Torah reading? I think like most people are good people. They don't want to deliberately steal or kill. The other mitzvahs are pretty straightforward. People believe in God, you know, honor their parents or try to as much as they can. But I think the sexual domain is the one that's the most dangerous. And that's where there's the most sins, yeah, especially today, whether it's, you know, pornography, prostitution and strip clubs. It's just like the sins are endless. I think that's why it's to emphasize that this is probably the biggest area of sin. And also in the in the array of Sfirot, Yesod, which is the whole sexual domain, that's the most difficult to rectify. And that's why a person who rectifies that is called a tzaddik. You know, in the Torah, very few people are called a tzaddik. Yosef a tzaddik. Because Yosef was the embodiment of that. He was able to withhold, restrain himself from sinning with Potiphar's wife and so on. He was like the perfect tzaddik because he was able to not sin sexually. Had like a proper monogamous marriage and everything. Now that you my memory, Abraham killed idolatry, Yitzhak murdered, Yaakov. Yeah, each one has their sphira, right? Chesed, Gua, Tiferet, Natsod, Yisod. So Yosef's challenge was in Yisod. And he overcame that, embodied that, and that's really being a tzaddik. And the Arizal said that the test in the final generations, in the end of days, another one of these prophecies that's come true, the Arizal said that the final test in the Kharita Yamim is Yesod, because that's the thing that's right before Malchut, before the kingdom of heaven on earth, before we come back to the Davidic dynasty on earth, before Mashiach comes, that's the, the bottom sphira of Malchut. The thing that stands above it is Yesod. And there's only one path to Malchut. It's through Yisod. The other Sfirot all have multiple connections. Malchut does not. It only has one connection to Yisod. That is the final barrier. And we see that in the world today. The world today, thankfully, morally, has improved in many different areas. And yet, in one area, it's degenerated tremendously. And that's in the area of Yisod. All things of sexuality today, it's never been this sinful in this particular domain. So that's another prophecy that's come true that the Arizal spoke a lot about. So yeah, so that was no same-sex marriage. That's from Chulin. It's, it's ironic that today this has become permitted and the symbol of this movement is a rainbow because the rainbow was precisely the symbol of the Noahide of, uh, that God showed Noah. Right? God showed Noah a rainbow and said, this is a sign that I will not destroy the world again for all those sins that people used to do Sins like sodomy, for instance. Right? So now that this is becoming permitted and acceptable and promoted again, and ironically and somewhat comically, their symbol is the rainbow flag. And I think it's actually related to another prophecy in the Zohar that where Rashbi says, You know, you shouldn't await for the, the footsteps of the Messiah until you see the rainbow all over the world. So there's different ways to interpret this. Some people say there will be some great rainbow in the sky in the end of days when Mashiach comes. 
But I think that's kind of hard to envision. I think it just literally means Rashbi saying, you know when Mashiach's coming, when you're going to see rainbows all over the world? Uh, yeah, that's how you know. When the Noahide covenant is being broken and you, see Noah, and you see rainbows all over the world, you should await the footsteps of the Messiah. So another sign, in case we need it any more, that we are indeed in the Messianic age, in the footsteps of the Messiah. The next is reproduction. Pru'urvu, which the Ramah Mifano actually listed as two, but there is a mitzvah to reproduce. The Gemara debates this question, are Noahides obligated to have children or not? Kind of leaves it unresolved, but the Ramah Mifano definitely says they are obligated to reproduce, which makes sense because God told Adam and Eve at the very beginning that you should reproduce and fill the world and so on. So it's pretty straightforward that everybody is obligated, should be reproducing, should be leaving behind progeny. God even told the animals to reproduce, so God wants to fill, fill the world with life. And so reproduction is one of them. Then related to that, since we do want to reproduce, the next one is not to prevent reproduction, which was castration. We spoke about that a lot. Sirus is also prohibited not to castrate animals. Although there could be exceptions when it, of course, involves risk to human life, for instance. In those situations, of course, if you have many animals, overpopulated animals, if they're affecting human life, if they're carrying diseases, then certainly you could do something about it, if necessary. And all dogs are No, not necessarily. Yeah. Right, so if you buy a dog that's already neutered, that's fine. No, it's not the same. The prohibition is the act... I hear you, but it's out of your hands. Right, yeah, yeah. That's, that's why I'm saying there's an exception, because if we don't neuter and spay a lot of these fast reproducing animals, then it's going to definitely affect the quality of our lives. There's going to be too many outside. And... Back to humans for a second, regarding the castration or whatever. Yeah. So, what, what, I mean, what happens? How does this apply to people who have already. You know, it's a difficult question. Officially, like, getting a vasectomy is not permitted or frowned upon. Or a woman getting their tube t- two tubes tied or whatever. But other things are, other things are f- permitted if they're not permanent. Which technically a vasectomy is not permanent either. So it's reversible. So there's, as long as it's not permanent, there's leeway. Yeah. If you fulfill the mitzvah, it's okay regardless, but like, especially if you fulfill the mitzvah of reproduction, like you can't be expected to keep having kids forever. You know, the Gemara debates what's the ideal way to do it. And there, it goes from as anywhere from one child is enough to four is the best. If not a girl or a boy, you gotta have at least a girl and a boy. There's different opinions, right? The, the le- most lenient opinion in the Gemara is that even if you had one child, you're good. You've left behind some progeny. Another opinion is two, another opinion is four. There's a debate what the ravu means. Ravu means to square, to multiply. So two squared is two four. One hold on, hold on. Two squared is four. So does the four include the original two or not? So if you have two parents and you square them, that's four. So now you have a family of four. Two became four. Does that fulfill the mitzvah or the parents don't count and two have to make four? So some say the ideal way is to have four kids and then you've squared preferably two boys, two girls, but you can't choose. So it's kind of like, it's kind of silly to demand that you have two boys, two girls. Like it's out of your hands, right? The most uh, stringent, let's say, or the most mehudal case is to have four kids. The most lenient is even one. The middle ground is two. But nowhere does it say you should have 15 or 10 or 12. Or Yaakov had 12, but he had four wives. Fine, give me four wives. I'll have 12. <laughs> that's, that's not, <laughs> that's nobody, by the way, nobody in the Torah has that many kids. Nobody. We only know of Adam's three. Moshe had two. Noah had three. You, you know, picked, Yosef had two. Yitzhak had two. Avram had, again, he had multiple wives. Binyamin had 10 kids, but according to the Midrash, he had two wives. No one person has. Leah has seven. That's probably the most that anyone. Why can't I find Mary? Exactly. Oh, we'll talk about this another day. We'll talk about the monogamy, polygamy. I have another shear just for that. That'll be for another day. It's clear in the Torah when God made Adam and Eve, he, he made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Eve and Janet and Susie. It was just Adam and Eve. So it's pretty clear that God, God intends for monogamy. But we'll talk about that another time.
but for now we, we go on the assumption of monogamy. Okay? So don't get any ideas. So castration is forbidden. And then not to crossbreed animals. Again, if, if an animal has been bred already, crossbred, you are permitted to use it. Sometimes animals crossbreed even in the wild. It does happen. Like a horse and a donkey could, especially in ancient times when there was a lot of them, it could happen. We, we see a few instances in Tanakh where even the Davidic dynasty, King David or King Solomon, used a mule. Mules are mentioned throughout the Tanakh, a pered. So. Yes, so, but similar, if animals are similar enough, they will potentially mate with each other even naturally. So the prohibition is for you not to crossbreed them deliberately, but if it happens naturally, it's fine, and you can use the cross of that animal, like you can use mules, and the Tanakh has examples of mules being used. So that's okay. And then the next one is similar, is not to graft, grafting trees. And here as well, the law is specifically about grafting totally different species together. But if you graft the same species, it's permitted. Like apples today, basically all the apples you eat come from grafted trees because apples are extreme heterozygotes. If you plant an apple seed from a certain apple expecting to get that apple, you won't get that apple. So the only way to ensure that you have an orchard of the same apple tree, if you want like red delicious apples, then they graft them all. If it's all considered like similar species, then it's fine. If they're different, totally different species, then it's not permitted. And again, you are permitted to use them if they've already happened on their own or by somebody else did it. If a Gentile did it or whatever, you are permitted to use it. You're permitted to buy various grafted fruits, crossbreed, hybrid species at the supermarket. You don't have to worry about that. As long as you didn't personally produce it or graft those different species together. Uh, of course, you, you can take this, the whole crossbreeding and grafting issue, you can expand that into a whole bigger field, which we also need to have a separate class on, which is genetic modification, all of that biotechnology, transgenics. Should we be doing that? Like they're, they're genetically modifying mosquitoes to not, be, to, not, to, not to be vectors of disease. They've made recently the Aqua Advantage salmon. They combined three different species into one meaty salmon. Uh, there's the, the flavor Are you saver. To eat them so that's the question. There's the flavor saver tomato, and the, there are positives to it. Like, I don't know if you know the story of papayas in Hawaii. There was a disease that was actually destroying millions of tons of crops, and they were actually able to, through genetic modification, save the papaya. So I think there are places where genetic modification is useful. There's some promising gene therapy. So when it comes to saving lives, we know that pikuach nefesh, saving lives is a very high value. We can use sometimes genetic modification to even save species that are going extinct, whether it's plants or animals. So I think there is a place for it. The fact that it exists, you know, there's a general idea that if something exists, there's some good way. There is some positive application of that. There is everything that exists has a bad way to use it and a good way to use it. So I think even genetic modification and all of this biotechnology, the fact that it exists means that there's a way to use it in the correct way. Like insulin also, we used to have to get insulin from the pigs and dog pancreases and now it's mostly just GMO from bacteria. And that's amazing. That's great for diabetics. That's great for medicine. It's cheaper. It's cleaner and so on and so on. Cheese also, you can make cheese with synthetic rennet and that also, you don't need cow stomachs anymore. So I think there are positive applications when done right to genetic modification, and, but that needs its own separate exploration. It's not necessarily all bad. Some people are like, wanna put a blanket prohibition on GMOs. It's not necessarily all bad. There have been bad cases of it, like with the soy, with the GMO soy, with Monsanto. I think Mexico recently banned all GMO corn they want to preserve their natural corn species, and that's, that's good. So there have been, there's been good and bad with genetic modification and biotechnology. So I, I think there is a way to use it properly. Then the next category is regarding human life. So not to murder, that's a simple one. And remember that, however, that if somebody's coming to kill you, the Gemara says, of course, that you are allowed to defend yourself. And it says in Sanhedrin, Im hashkem lehogo, right? If somebody comes to kill you, then of course you can defend yourself and do a preemptive strike first. 
And there, I think I mentioned this last time, the Lubavitcher Rebbe had a really interesting interpretation of this. He says the exact wording here is Hashkem Leolgo. It doesn't say if somebody comes to kill you, you kill him. It actually adds an extra word there, which is Hashkem. You should rise up. And the Lubavitcher Rebbe said that many times just rising up is enough, meaning display your strength, project that strength, and the person who's coming to get you will often cower away and back down and retreat. So the Rebbe would, would say the importance of projecting strength and rising up and not cowering in fear, that's really important. But it says Hashkem lehol go. Right. If you need to, you still lehol go. But meaning step one is Hashkem. There's that extra word. That word didn't have to be there. It could have just said, if somebody's coming to kill you, you'll kill him. But it adds hashkem leolgo. So yeah, self-defense is permitted. And then related to murder, we saw how also the Gemara derives abortion because it says shofech dam adam ba'adam. So spilling the blood of a person in a person. And the Gemara says, what's a person in a person? You have to say abortion. It must mean abortion. So also abortion is the next one. Is considered murder. And again, there are exceptions. We have to preserve the life of the mother if there's a risk to her. And there may be other medical, if, if necessary, there are certain exceptions. But generally speaking, abortions are also forbidden. Next is easy not to steal. That's across the board. And then there was the one where it says not to strike a fellow Jew. So it was, it was not to strike a Jew. And the truth is that the place, the way that the Gemara derives it, it's actually using a verse in Mishle, which actually says Mokesh Adam, that a person who really traps or strikes another human. So it doesn't really just mean Jew. It means it's everybody, really. We shouldn't be hitting each other. And the, the Gemara there says that anybody who even rises, raises their hands against their fellow is called wicked, right? So we, we don't want a world where people are hitting each other, abusing each other, harassing each other. So this is really any harassment of another individual is forbidden. And that's pretty obvious and straightforward. So not to strike any fellow human being. But again, there is the self-defense part. If somebody's coming to harm you, of course, you don't have to turn the other cheek. You have to fight back and defend yourself and your family and your brother. Because the Torah says, Al ta'amod al dam re'echa. Don't stand by idly while your fellow is being harmed. Right? So you have to stand up and defend. Then the Gemara also says in the same pages that it's a mitzvah for even Noahides to give charity. It, it derives it from the term tzedakah mishpat from Avraham. Avraham, before his covenant, before his special covenant, at the beginning of his life, he was a Noahide. Avraham started off as a Noahide. So from the Torah's mention that Avraham would keep tzedakah u mishpat, justice, charity and justice, the Gemara implies that Noahides should also engage in charity and volunteer work and tzedakah. And it actually, interestingly enough, the Talmud debate has an interesting debate here. We're not going to go into it, but it implies that, that the mishpat part should be the obligation of men and the tzedakah part, the obligation of women. So the mishpat, the judgment, the, the laws, the courts, that leave that for the men. And meanwhile, the women should be involved with the charity work and the volunteer work and the tzedakah. Uh, interesting discussion there. So mishpat for the men, tzedakah for the women. But everybody, really all Noahides are obligated in both tzedakah and mishpat. So the next one's also the courts of law. And that's an interesting one too. So the, one of the seven Noahide laws was this, is called dinin. So what does that mean exactly? You know, the Rambam talks about this as establishing courts that enforce the Noahide laws. But there is a, a wider understanding of any courts that Noahides, that Gentiles should establish their own courts to maintain order in their societies. And they are allowed to institute their own laws, whatever other laws they need to maintain order in their societies. So all of the rules, civil laws, we have to follow. And we call that dina de malchuta dina, right? Even Jews also. A Jew has to follow the law of the land in which he lives. If you don't like it, move somewhere else. You live in Canada, you have to follow Canadian law. You live in the U.S., you have to follow American law. You have to do what, whatever it is, is the law. You have to follow the law. Whether it's following the road signs or tax laws or whatever it is, you have to follow the law of the country. As long as it doesn't contradict, blatantly contradict something, some Torah law, right? So if you have a, an evil government that's imposing evil laws, that's a different story. But generally speaking, 
in a democratic country especially, although it's questionable if we still have that today, <laughs> but uh, you have to follow the law of the land. So that's called Dina de Malchuta Dina. A Jew is obligated to follow the law of the land and certainly a Noahide also has to follow the law of the land. That's all under the category of dinin, of establishing courts of law and following the, the law of the land and the this court system, this, this, the courts, whatever the judges decide, uh, society has to, gives power to the judges to make certain so sentences, and we have to follow their sentence, otherwise society falls apart, there's going to be anarchy. If people don't follow what the courts say, everybody does whatever they want, then their society will fall apart into anarchy. Okay, and then we have the dietary laws, so the limb of a live animal, ever minachai, and then not to consume, we saw also animal blood, so related to that. Again, I don't think it's for a Noahide, they don't have to go to the extent of necessarily buying only kosher meat, because the truth is, even non-kosher meat today in the Western world is properly cleaned, they do drain the blood, they don't sell you bloody meat. When they slaughter, even in non-kosher slaughterhouses, they slaughter the animals and they do drain them, so they don't have, they're not full of blood, so it's, that's fine, but you can't consume animal blood. And then we have both the Rama and the, and the Gaon include Nevela, not to eat dead carcasses. So again, in Western law, in Western countries, animals that are sold, meat that's sold in stores cannot be dead carcass meat. The animal actually has to be fresh and slaughtered. They're not allowed to sell you dead carcasses. C- could it be that sometimes there's a dead carcass and you don't know? Yes, but there are inspections, there are checks and things like that, and hopefully the government's doing its job. And generally speaking, though, the meat that you eat, or not you eat, but the, not even the non-kosher meat, is proper, is slaughtered, and it's not dead carcasses. That's also, nevela is also one of them, and also part of that is even human flesh. So not to eat human carcasses or human, cannibalism is also forbidden, as it clearly says again in Masechet Chulin. So that's that. So that gives us 26. And then we have the last few. One is Birkat Hashem, which literally is blessing God, but it was always interpreted as, well, you don't have to bless God as long as you don't curse God. So it was seen as a prohibition of not to curse God. But Shmuel Gaon actually literally took it as, no, you have to bless God. And he listed tefillah as an actual requirement that Noahides do have to pray, which makes sense as well. Noahides want to be connected to God, want to have a relationship with God. So how? What's, well, how do you have a relationship with God? You have to be in communication with God. You pray. You have to have tefillah. The Torah calls that the service of the heart. So yes, Noahides should pray as well to bless God. And the Gaon also includes Yehud Hashem, recognizing God's oneness and praying to the one God. He also has korbanot. He also says, you know, the prayers were instituted corresponding to the korbanot. So there's a clear link between sacrifices, offerings, and prayers. So Shmuel Gaon also includes korbanot. And again, the 30 laws are for the Messianic age. The third temple is forthcoming. If we're very soon going to have, again, the opportunity to offer sacrifices or other offerings, then Noahites are also permitted and will partake in those as well, in korbanot. In the meantime, yeah, there's different views. There's different views of whether the third temple will have sacrifices at all. So, like we saw in Ishayahu 56, it says that the third temple will be a Beit Fila. It'll be a house of prayer, not necessarily a house of sacrifices. And we say that the Mincha of Yerushalayim, Minchat Yehuda, will come back Keshanim Kadmoniot. That the Mincha, which is a grain offering. So there's also there's some verses that suggest that the third temple will not have sacrifices. The Rambam seems to kind of say two different things, because in, one, in Moren Nebuchim, he argues that we will never do sacrifices again. Uh, but in the Mishnah Torah, he seems to say we will. So there's different views on whether the third temple will have sacrifices or not. Some say maybe just for a brief period of time, like we'll need to do the red cow, para aduma, so that we can purify everybody. So there might be a little bit of sacrifices, at the, at the beginning of this thing, that for the inauguration and purification and so on. And then there will only be grain offerings, incense, things like that. So which prayers can Noahide say? Can a Noahide say modani when they wake up in the morning? Sure, why not? That's, not? that's a very generic prayer. Thank God for allowing me to wake up and have another great day. 
That's a good thing to say. Healthy psychology. Wake up on a positive note. Say Modani. Uh, so every Jew should say it, and every Noahide should say it. Why not? Reciting Tehillim, that's already become universal anyways. Tehillim is recited, Psalms are recited in churches and in other religious institutions all over the world. That's become universal. And most of Psukeit Zimra is Tehillim. So it's perfectly fine to recite Psalms. Uh, the Amida is specifically for Jews. So that wouldn't make sense, because you're saying Eloi Avraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, and so on. So you're actually invoking our specific Israelite history. So it probably wouldn't make sense to say the Amidah or the Shema for that matter, because Shema is for Israel, Shema Yisrael. I, I know there are Noahide Sidurim out there. I haven't seen them myself, but I have heard that they exist and they have askamot from various rabbis. So they do exist. I've never seen them, but there are actual Noahide Sidurim with prayers for Noahides. And the Brachot is a big one because part of prayers is making brachas. So which brachas should a Noahide be allowed to say? Well, anything that doesn't qualify with Asher Kitshanu B'mitzvotav V'tzivanu, which is that God commanded us to do it, that should be fine. If it's just a bracha on an apple, that's just a genelic. Thank God, the, mass, the king of the universe for making this apple. Why not? Right? If another person is affirming God's oneness and recognizing the creator, that's a good thing. So any blessings like on food, especially the blessings before, those should, should be fine. Uh, there is a Kabbalistic aspect to making brachas, the whole Arizal that part of it, the Zohar Arizal, that when you make a bracha, you break through the klipot and you free the nitzotzot. So could a, non, a, Gentile, could a Gentile soul, does it have that particular ability to break through the klipot and free nitzotzot? Probably not. I think that's something that a Jewish, that requires a, a soul of Israel. But that's on a sod level. There's still a pshat level of making a bracha just to say thank you, and that should be universal. We want to have more gratitude and positive energy, positive psychology. So I don't see any issue with a Noahide saying a bracha to thank Hashem for whatever, for food, for clothing, even a sheikhiyanu. Anything that doesn't have an asher kitshanu, that's not a specific mitzvah that's commanded to them. Okay, so that was that, and we have just a few left, and we're done. And do something a little Kabbalistic at the end. Because we didn't get to the Kabbalah of being a Noahide. Like it's all been very legal language. What, what, is, what does the Arizal say about Noahide? So I want to f- conclude with that. Yeah, the bracha doesn't have to be in Hebrew also, for sure. Absolutely, that'll count in any language. Good point. Okay, then we have learning Torah. So we already addressed that before. But we said that previously it was not expected for, and, and it's almost prohibited really for Gentiles to learn like Gemara, Zohar, and so on. But we made the case last time that it, we should open up Torah learning to the whole world. And even remember Rabbi Meir says that even an idolater who learns Torah can have ascend to the level of a high priest of a Kohen Gadol. And the Midrash says in multiple places, the same verse in Yalkut Shimoni, in Tana Deve Eliyahu, that Meida Ni that I bear witness, at Hashamayim Ve'et Ha'aretz, God brings heaven and earth to bear witness, that Bein Goy Bein Israel, whether it's a Gentile or a Jew, Bein Ish Bein Isha, a man or a woman, Bein Eved Bein Shifcha, a slave or a maid, that the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, could rest on any person, man or woman, slave or free person, or Gentile or Jew. It just depends on a person's deeds. And how do you get Ruach HaKodesh if not through learning Torah? And we mentioned briefly last time that the Gemara does list Gentile prophets. It lists seven of them. Bilam was a Gentile prophet. It says, Shiva Nevi'im Nitnabu Leomot HaOlam. There were seven prophets for the Gentiles. Bilam was one. Eov, there's a debate whether Eov was Jewish or not. But Eov is considered to be a Gentile too. And there are others, his four friends. So yes, uh, Gentiles could be prophets, could have Ruach HaKodesh. And the Midrash says that clearly. So that's learning Torah. Now is the time to share it with the world. It's going to make the world a better place. It's going to make people's lives more meaningful and better. And it'll help to stop anti-Semitism. And this was a story that I wanted to share last time. Somebody emailed me, a virtual friend, not somebody I ever met, but somebody I've spoken to over the years. And they emailed me and said, okay, I don't know what to do. There was like a Facebook group or whatever. And one of their friends posted something like very anti-Semitic, 
like saying the Talmud is evil and satanic and this and that and like all this anti-Semitic stuff. And he said, well, what should I do? And I said, okay, just share with him. We, we did a couple of classes on understanding the Talmud and is the Talmud racist? I said, just share with him those videos, ask him to watch it. And then let's see what happens. So he shared the videos. And then a few days later, I get an email back and he said, wow, it worked. The person uh, saw the videos, retracted his, deleted his previous post, put a new post apologizing for the previous one and said, you know, I was wrong and whatever. And so even just that, you know, once you show people what the Talmud actually is, it changes everything. So somebody who was falling into the trap of anti-Semitism and into that silly conspiracy theory and all this nonsense of satanic this and that, you could actually just show them, here's the Talmud, here. Like, we have nothing to hide. Learn it and see the beauty of it. And so this person actually did a 180 and, and actually apologized for it publicly. So just a, a quick story to show how if we open up the Torah, you show people the beauty of Talmud, of Kabbalah, Zohar, whatever, that'll help to combat anti-Semitism and misinformation and crazy conspiracy theories. So, and that's part of switching from a Galut mindset to a Geula mindset. We have to stop thinking that we're in Galut, that we're in exile, we're oppressed. We have to stay you know, hidden and, and uh, detached from everybody else and keep everything to ourselves. It's time to s- spread the message to the whole world. I have a more global consciousness, a Geula mindset. And the same goes for Shabbat. And we talked about this last time as well, that the world needs Shabbat today more than ever to disconnect from all of this mental digital slavery. And people really need to rest and reconnect with family and community and stop with all the materialism and money and just have a day where you detach from money and electronics and driving places and doing all the bad news and fake news and screen time. So I think the whole world needs Shabbat. It doesn't necessarily, I don't think Noahides and Gentiles necessarily need to keep every rabbinic halacha. I don't think that's required. I think they should just keep like the basic Torah, keep Shabbat on a deoraita, on a Torah level. What does the Torah say about Shabbat? Don't work, you know, don't use fire for whatever it is, whether it's cooking or driving. Mm -hmm. If you have a combustion engine, then you can't drive. But I would even expand that to an electric car, even though an electric car doesn't actually have literal fire. But we don't want to drive places. The Torah says you shouldn't come out of your community on Shabbat. So you want to stay within your community, within your family. Don't drive anywhere. Don't go to the mall. Stop shopping. Stop with the screens. Just relax. You know, no cooking. No, don't worry about chores. No guard, no field work. Whatever the Torah actually says, to have oneg, to have delight on Shabbat, to rest, to reconnect with, with God, with your Creator, with your family, with your community. But you understand, 2,000 years ago, Rabbi Yehuda had a friend, mm-hmm. a Roman friend, that learned Torah with him. Right, yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. So I'm saying we have to open up Torah to the whole world, and Shabbat as well. So there was a related question of tefillin. That was a really difficult one. Um, can a Noahide put on tefillin? So it's... it's it's a difficult question. Some would say, oh, well, it's like mezuzah. If a Noahide can put on a mezuzah, why not tefillin? Well, it's not quite the same because mezuzah is a passive thing that you put on your door. Tefillin is actually something active that you bind onto your arm every day. And the four parchments inside are specifically talking about the mitzvah of tefillin and the mitzvah of Pesach, which we said a Noahide isn't supposed to partake in and it talks about peterechem of the redemption of the firstborn so the things that the tefillin is associated with are much more specifically relevant to israel so that's the first thing to keep in mind the other thing is that you know that you've heard this idea that there are three signs that got between us and god that there is shabbat is a sign ot i benu v'nechem, and then brit milah is a sign and tefillin is called a sign right so with Shabbat, we said, yes, Shabbat has always been a sign between us and God. But then God himself says in Ishayahu and in other places in the prophets that he ultimately wants the whole world to keep Shabbat. So there's a clear precedent for that sign to evolve and encompass the whole world. Because God himself said so. You know, Ishayahu clearly has God saying all Nochrim should keep Shabbat. But when it comes to Brit Milah, there is no such statement. And so Noahides are not obligated in circumcision. And there's also no such statement with tefillin. There's no precedent for it. Everything that we say has to have some precedent in scripture or something. But there's no precedent. We don't have anything that suggests that a Noahide can have tefillin. We saw precedent for mezuzah because we saw the story of Ardaban, King, that Rabbi Udanasi sent a mezuzah to Ardaban. 
So we have a precedent for that. We don't have any precedent for a Noahide or a Gentile putting on tefillin. So I would say no to the tefillin because it's something that is specific to Israel and there's no source anywhere in Tanakh that suggests otherwise. No, that's what I'm saying. Shabbat, no, because later there is clearly a verse in Ishayah that says in the end of days, Shabbat will be universal. So there's a clear precedent for that. God himself says that in the end of days, everybody should keep Shabbat, but there is no such verse for Tefillin. That's what I mean. There's a clear difference between them. Who? Ishmaelites? Again, any Gentile could be a Noahide. If they so choose. Yeah, so circumcision, circumcision is interesting. The Rambam has a very, in the same, in Ilchot Melachim, he says something really cool. I actually have it here. He says, Amila Nitztava was commanded to Avraham and his descendants, Bilvad, only to Avraham and his descendants. Yatzaz Zarosh al Ishmael, which means that Ishmael is actually not obligated to be, to be circumcised. But Yitzhak is obligated to be circumcised. But then he says something really interesting. He says, That Avraham's later children, Ishmael was not obligated to circumcise because he was already born. When the mitzvah of circumcision was given, Ishmael had already been alive and God did not command Ishmael to circumcise. He commanded... Yeah, so he commanded Avraham to circumcise, and Avraham himself then circumcised his whole household, even his slaves and so on. But the mitzvah only passed on to Yitzhak, because the Torah clearly says that what Avraham passed on that whole heritage specifically to Yitzhak, which means that Ishmael was exempt. However, the sages say that the later children, the Bnei Keturah, were also obligated in circumcision, because they came after the mitzvah. So the Rambam says that uh, because today he says Bnei Ishmael and Bnei Keturah have intermixed and intermarried, and we don't actually know what is the difference between them, we assume that Ishmaelites are also Bnei Keturah, and so they should circumcise. So interestingly enough, the Rambam says that Ishmaelites should be circumcised, but other Gentiles don't have to be. But generally it's not one of the Noahide laws in any case. So a Noahide is not obligated to circumcise. And then, so the last one, we're at the end, number 30. Number 30 is given as kibud Torah, of honoring Torah. And that was very mysterious. What does it mean to honor Torah exactly? That was the last thing mentioned in Masechet Chulin. So the Gaon reworked it to, instead of writing kibud Torah, he wrote kibud Avve'em, honoring parents. So it's interesting, how did he do that? He replaced this one, honoring Torah, with honoring parents, which is really interesting. The truth is there is a clear link between them because honoring Torah and honoring Torah scholars and honoring parents are all kind of connected. Yeah, and remember Rabbi Akiva derived it. Rabbi Akiva would derive when there's a word et, it's superfluous. Usually when you have et in Hebrew, it's not needed. So et could be anything from aleph to taf. Et is aleph taf. So the Rabbi Akiva and his school of thought was et could be something else. So from various places, like et, et Hashem Elokecha Tira, you should revere God. Well, what's the et there? The et is not necessary. So you can derive from that that you should, derive, you should revere God's law and you should revere those who know God's law. So there's an aspect of honoring Torah and honoring Torah scholars from that. It's interesting just for a minute to discuss this. Why, what is this idea of honoring people who know Torah? Why is that even necessary? Like, he's just a guy, like me. What? Like, we're all human. We all kind of respect each other. So why does somebody who knows Torah deserve extra respect? What is... Why? Now, if you think about it scientifically, if you have a Torah scroll, we all honor the Torah. We take it out of the ark. Everybody stands up. People come. They kiss it. They hug it. They touch it. We on, the Torah is holy. Well, what makes the Torah holy? What about this? It's about a bunch of sheepskin with some ink, some letters, you know. Is the sheepskin holy? No. Right. The ink isn't holy. The ink is not inherently holy. Neither is the sheepskin or the covering or the crown. So what actually makes that Torah holy? It's the words. It's the information on it. 
Right. The, only, the reason that that becomes holy is because of the information on it. Otherwise, it's just organic chemistry. It's just carbon and stuff, oxygen, nitrogen. But what's holy about it is the information on it. So if I then read the Torah and download it into my brain, and I have that same information in my brain, what is the difference between my brain and the Torah scroll? Nothing. It's just a bunch of carbon containing information. It's organic chemistry arranged in the form of these holy words. And so in the same way that you honor Torah because of the information it contains, if a person contains in that same information, therefore they contain that same holiness because it's the information that's holy. And that's where that idea comes from. It's not that you're honoring that person. You're not honoring their carbon-based body because that's the same as everybody else. That's just material. It's the information that's there, that's contained therein, that's special. So, so would you say it's the energy of the information? Yes, that's, that's right. I believe so. So, yeah. for example, a blind person couldn't see the Torah, but it's like Torah. Sure, no difference. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's all the same information. It's all in there. Yeah. So that's really where it's, com- where it's coming from. So honoring parents, honoring God, honoring Torah, they're all, re- all related. Your parents are your creators. God is your creator. The Torah is the blueprint of creation. It's all really the same theme of honoring where you came from. Right? You come from a, the Torah lineage. You come from your parents. You come from Hashem. So it's all res- giving respect to that to your background, to your heritage, to those who know the law and so on. And uh, so you can see the connection between honoring parents and honoring Torah scholars. There's a lot of halachic questions of who do you need to honor first, your rabbi or your father? You know, if, each, if your father lost his wallet and your rabbi lost his wallet and you found both of them, who should you give back first? So there's all, like all kinds of interesting questions like that. There's overlap between your physical father and your spiritual father. Ideally, your physical father is your spiritual father. That's the best if a father teaches his own child Torah. So there is a clear connection there. So I think that's where Shmuel Gaon says, you know, Kibbut Torah is Kibbut Avem. And uh, of course, the sages tell us if you want to know how to honor Gentile, uh, how to honor parents, you, you learn that from a Gentile, actually. He gives various stories. Asav honored his father very well. The sages say Asav was amazing at honoring his parents. There's a story of Dama Barnetina. You remember the story? We don't have time for it. But Dama Barnetina had a certain um, gem that was on the ephod, on the high priest's breastplate. And the sages needed it, but it was under his father's pillow and his father was sleeping and he didn't want to wake him up. When the sages came to buy this precious gem, which was worth whatever, millions, but he wouldn't wake up his father because it would be disrespectful to his father and he lost out on the opportunity to make all that money. But then God blessed him and the following year, the sages needed a para aduma and he happened to have one. So he sold it for the same amount of money that the jewel was worth. So he made his money. And the, the, the Gemara says, you see, like even this Gentile kept, Shabbat, uh, kept the mitzvah of honoring parents so well, you can learn it from him. And he wasn't even obligated to honor his parents because it wasn't one of the seven Noahide mitzvahs, but it is now within the list of 30. In the expanded list of 30, honoring parents is part of this uh, general mitzvah of kibud, and you can summarize it with Ben Zoma's statement in Pirkei Avot, Ezu mechubad amechabedet abriot, right? Who is the honorable person? The one that honors all others. So I think it's a general mitzvah of respecting your fellow. I would include here even Lashon Ara. Some people asked, are Noahides obligated in the pro- prohibition of Lashon Ara? Yeah, why not? That's also something that's really negative. I think it's universally recognized that slander, gossip, evil speech, that's universally seen as something really bad and disrespectful and dishonorable. So I think that all fits under honoring each other and respecting each other. And it's really part of, the, you, if you look at the Ten Commandments, it's part of also like Lotachmod. Is, if, now you have all Ten Commandments really in the 30. If you add Lotachmod, not to be jealous, envious, of your neighbor, 
not to covet what is your neighbor's, not to plot to take what is somebody else's. It's all part of building that peaceful, harmonious society where everybody respects each other. That is the world that we want. That is the world that we want to build. This is the era, the messianic era, where we live in peace and harmony. So, of course, that should be included as well. It's all part of the general umbrella of kibbud, of honoring one another. And now you actually have all Ten Commandments, which bring, brings us right back to the beginning. Where did we start? We started by talking about the Ten Commandments and that the Torah's text of the Ten Commandments has exactly 620 letters, which our sages say 620 refers to the 613 laws for Israel and the seven Noahide laws. Both Israelite law and Noahide law was encapsulated in the Ten Commandments in the divine revelation at Sinai. And that revelation was meant to be universal. Remember what Chazal say, that God actually offered the Ten Commandments to the whole world. It's based on a verse that we read. It's in the last parsha in the Zot Bracha, in the last parsha of the Torah. Right at the beginning, it says, Vayomer Hashem misinai ba, that before he came to Sinai, Zarach misseir lamo, he first went to Seir. He first went to the Edomites and offered them the Ten Commandments. And then Hophia me'al Paran. And then he went to Paran and offered it to the Ishmaelites. And they didn't take it. And only then did he go to Sinai and give it to Israel and give them an Eshdat Lamo, a fiery Torah, a fiery law that Israel took upon themselves. But God's original intention was for the Ten Commandments to be universal. That was his will. That's the Keter. That is the Ratzon of God, the crown of God. Remember in the Sfilot, Keter is the will of God. His original will, his original intention was for the Ten Commandments to be universal. And so now you can see how we have all Ten Commandments within the 30 Noahide laws for the Messianic age. If you look at the Ten Commandments, the first one is to know God, to know that there's one God. That's the Noahide mitzvah of Yehud Hashem, as Shmuel Gaon calls it, recognizing God's oneness. The second of the Ten Commandments is not to worship idols. That's Avodah Zarah in the Noahide laws. The third one is not to take God's name in vain, which is the same as the Noahide mitzvah of not blaspheming God, not cursing God. Then you have keeping Shabbat, which we now see also will apply to the Noahides. Then you have honoring parents, which we saw as part of Kibbud Avem, which Shmuel Gaon lists as one of the 30 Noahide laws. And then you have murder and adultery and theft, which are Noahide laws. And then we have bearing false witness. And Shmuel Gaon also includes that as a distinct one of the 30 Noahide laws, which makes sense because if they're obligated in Dinin and Mishpat, if they're obligated in courts and civil laws and justice and judgment, then of course they are also obligated in uh, swearing properly and not to bear false witness and not to make false oaths. So that's the ninth of the Ten Commandments. And finally, you have not to covet. So if you include not to covet in the general mitzvah of kibbud, of honoring others and building a peaceful, harmonious society, then you actually have all Ten Commandments within the 30 Noahide laws, as we should expect and as God always intended for the Ten Commandments to be universal. And I think it fits into what's happening now, or recently what's happening in the United States. If you've heard of the whole debate of putting up the Ten Commandments in public places, in public schools, in front of courthouses, should the Ten Commandments be displayed? In some states, they are being displayed. In others, others will argue that it's a violation of separating church and state. But I think it's a good thing. I think it's all part of this trend at the end of days of revealing, bringing Torah to the world, bringing the Ten Commandments to the world. And now you even see this in states in America that want to display the Ten Commandments to remind everybody, to remind all of mankind about these fundamental laws. So I have a, a chart of all the 30 listed and I color coded it in blue for the positives and red for the negatives. So I'll, I'll make a PDF out of it and I'll share it. I'll put it on the YouTube link or on my website, whatever. And I put it as 30 on the left as the actual laws and then the various precepts on the right that they fall under. And I left Tzedakah Mishpat to the end as the last two because Ishayahu actually says, that the redemption will come specifically, I will restore your judges like in the old days, your counselors like in the past. And then, and then Jerusalem will be called by a new name, city of righteousness. And then, this is the key part, and you've heard this before, that Zion will be redeemed through justice, 
and all those that come back. It's repentant ones, the returnees, through charity. So justice and charity is key to bring the final redemption. So I, I ended the list with tzedakah and mishpat, because that's what's going to help us bring the redemption. What's cool about this list, when I actually counted everything, you have 30 mitzvahs, 8 are positive, 22 are negative, which are also symbolic numbers, 8 and 22. 22 Hebrew letters, 8 is a symbol of eternity, infinity, of covenant. Uh, if I can just do the last 10 minutes, I know it's late, but 10 more minutes just to get into a little bit of the Kabbalah of this. Where, where, what are the spiritual origins of the Noahides? The three sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Yefet. And the Aries also is something amazing. So if you spell Shem and Yefet and Ham, the initials Shem, Yefet, Ham is Siach. Shin, Yud, Chet is Siach. That word appears first, right at the beginning of the Torah. Chol siach asadet terem It's right, Genesis chapter 2. There was not yet any vegetation on the earth. And the Arizal says that that vegetation, siach, is an allusion to the Noahides. And it says there uh, that there was no vegetation on the earth. The chol esev hasadet terem itzmach. And none of the weeds of the field had yet flourished. And... So remember, Sadeh is, we said last time, we brought it up a few lessons ago, that Sadeh is a euphemism for a woman. The woman is considered like a field, sometimes like a house, sometimes like a field. So the Arizal actually has a whole meditation on this and says Sadeh represents the feminine, the Malchut. And above that, above Malchut is Netzahod Yisod, which is the grass of the field. So if you can visualize the Sfirot, Netzahod Yisod are the grasses that grow out of the field, the Sadeh which is Malchut, if you can visualize it. And he says that Shem, Ham, and Yefet are Netzah, Hod, Yisod, extensions of Chesed, Gurat, Iferet. So I'm going a little Kabbalistic here. But he's saying, In Yan Zeyuvan, Bema Shabiyarnu, Begimel, Bnei Noach, Shem, Ham, ve Yefet, Roshet, Tevot, Siach, Noach, Be Yisod, Noach represented, again, the sphere of Yisod, of sexual purity. He was sexually pure in a generation, in the pre-flood generation that was sexually very impure. And he was called Tzaddik too, Hanikra Tzaddik. We had Yosef Tzaddik and we have Noach Tzaddik. He was called the only Tzaddik in his days, and his generation. And his three children are Em Sod Nehi, Netzah Hod Yusod. Shem is Netzach and Yefet is Hod, he says, and Ham is also Bisod. Ham, remember, had a problem. He did something wrong sexually and he was cursed. So Ham failed specifically in Yisod. That was his big test. Where Yosef succeeded and Noach succeeded, Ham failed. But this is the path to the Sadim. No? Yes, and Ham was cursed, but that curse will be lifted and will be finally restored, uh, rectified now at the end of days. Again, as we go back to a Garden of Eden, all of mankind will be rectified and Ham will also be rectified. So long story short, the Arizal says how the path to the Sadeh, to Malchut, is through Netzahod Yisod, which is actually, again, corresponds to Shem, Ham, and Yefet. And he then says something really cool. He says the same word rearranges, Shem, Ham, Yefet, Shin, Chet, Yud, spells Shechi. Shechi is the armpit. Now that might not sound so pleasant, but the truth is that the armpit is actually considered erva. It's considered something very sexually uh, attractive. You know, that's why supermodels are always posing with their, with their um, arms up, with their uh, armpits open. No, it's true. Uh, and the, no, no, the sages point out how it's dafka when, I know it sounds funny, but isn't that what they do with their whole thing? With the, uh, well, it's, in, it's interesting also the sage, well, it's true. When people are dressed immodestly, they specifically want to keep their armpits uncovered, their shoulders and their armpits uncovered. We consider that somehow revealing and immodest. And to cover your shoulders and your elbows is considered modest. So there's something about el- armpits that's immodest and has a lot of sexual energy. And the sages even point out that armpit hair starts to grow at the same time as pubic hair. There's a, connect, there's a clear sexual connection there between the armpits and, you know, the reproductive organ. So that's called shechi, right? And it's that same kind of sexual energy of yisod that needs to be conquered at the end of day so that we can enter malchut. So Shem, Ham, and Yefet correspond to that. We're all part of this cosmic body, and Shem, Ham, and Yefet stem from that area, which is a very powerful area. 
And when we can overcome that and rectify it, again, that's the, the test that we're in right now, is all about tikkun abrit, it's all about yisod, it's all about rectifying all those sexual sins, that sexual energy. And so uh, this is where we're at today. There's all this latent power even within the Noahides. That's why I keep saying that the Noahide movement is, is the key, really, as, as this information spreads among Gentiles as we get more righteous Noahides, that's what's going to bring Geula. That's what's going to bring us into the Sadeh, into the field, into Malchut, into that kingdom, the restoration of the kingdom. And remember, Siach also, the Arizal doesn't say this here, but Siach is, we say this all the time in the Kedusha. We say, Nakdishach v'naritzach kenoam Siach sod sarfei kodesh. It's the speech of the holy angels. We say this constantly in the Kedusha, that we want to mimic the, the Siach, the divine speech of the holy angels. So Siach also has that holy power of the divine speech. That's also Siach. That's also Shem, Yefet, Cham. There's a great deal of power there. So we have to stop uh, ignoring it. And we have to, again, bring Torah to the world. That's the key to Geula. And finally, can I just finish? And then, uh, the last thing is, uh, I'm going to end with this. It's our, now is the time to spread Torah to the world. That's how we enter the Messianic age. And I'll end with Ishayahu 11, chapter 11, which begins with describing Mashiach. It's the Eftarah that we read on Pesach. It begins by describing this person, Mashiach, and then it goes on and says, So the root, the, the st- whatever, the stock of Yishai, which is Mashiach, the descendant of, of King David, the son of Yishai, will be a nes, will be a flag to all the peoples. Again, there's this call to spread Torah to the whole world for all the amim. Elav goim idroshu. And to him, to Mashiach, will all the Gentiles go. Remember we said last time, the Midrash says, who is Mashiach for? Mashiach is, is going to teach the Torah to the Jews? No, the Jews know the Torah. Mashiach needs to also teach Torah to the non-Jews. That's really one of his main tasks. More than teaching Torah to the Jews, Mashiach needs to spread Torah to the Gentiles. And Elav goim idroshu, and to him all the Gentiles will turn. And so when we spread Torah to the nations, that's when you know, Mashiach will come. That's when we can solve all the issues that are plaguing the Jewish world. And because Ishayahu says, On that day, That then God will bring back all of the remaining Jews that are still not in the Holy Land. All of us here, God will bring them back again to the Holy Land. And then, And there will, he will hold up a sign to the nations. And he will hold up a sign to the nations. And God will gather everybody from all the four corners of the world. And here's the, the big part that I wanted to highlight. And only then, and then they shall pounce on the Philistines, Yama, that are along the coast, Yachdav together, Yavozu et bnei Kedem, Edom, Umoav, Mishloch, Yadam. Finally, we will be able to defeat all of our oppressors that are constantly trying to destroy us. So the conflict with today's Philistines will only end then. You know, this problem, when is it going to go away? When is all this nonsense going to stop? Ishayahu is saying only then. We need to spread Torah to the, for all the goyim, for all the nations of the world. Only then will we be able to finally make peace in the region and live peacefully in our holy land. And then it continues into the next chapter. Uh, and only then, on that day, you will say, Hashem ki bi, you will finally be able to thank God. And although we, we will say, although God, you were wrathful with us and you punished us a lot, as we have seen in recent days and in the past throughout our history, God has given us a lot of, of uh, you know, he didn't spare the rod from us. So he's given us many challenges, but we'll say, although you were angry with us and so on, but finally we can thank you with full heart. Hine el Yeshuati, because God is, you know, our salvation. Eftach velo efchad, and then we will no longer have to be afraid. Ki oziv ezimrat Yashem, we say this all the time in our prayers. Ve'ihilil Yeshua, then God will be our salvation. And then, finally, we will, u'sha'aftem ma'im besasson nima'ayaneh ha'yeshua, and then we will be able to, draw water from the spring of salvation. So we're almost there. 
and we, we see very clearly what we need to do. So let's do it together and, and merit bring about this final redemption. We'll end with that.